Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait for a few minutes for everyone to get on, and then we'll be good to go. I'm just drinking my tea today. No more wine for me. Last time I spilled it all over my pants at the very beginning of the broadcast. So that's it for me. Okay. I see we have uh, we have fans commenting already. It's great. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. That's great. I think we have people on already, so we will get started. Okay, guys, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. It's currently 7 p.m. here in Ireland. Uh, we have a very special guest joining us today, and I'm super exciting, exciting, excited, uh, because he is a really amazing retoucher, a very established, amazing work, um, an incredible person. Oh, um, as well. So please welcome Pratik. Hello, Pratik. How are you doing? Hello, today? Anita. How's it going? I am good. How are you? How is how is your day? How is the weather today? Where you are? The weather is fantastic. I'm not too far from you, so I'm in Oxford right now, and yeah, today I couldn't have asked for any any better weather. How about you? Same. It was so good today. I went for like a nice little walk with my dog, and it was just so beautiful. It was just like warm, and I was like. <laughs> It was just sunny. It was so nice. We had, like the trees, the birds. It was amazing. Um, I actually, when I was walking in the park, I sent Bella a photo because there's loads of little tiny blue flowers blossoming, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my god, Bella would love it." <laughs> so I just sent <laughs> so it. Funny. Bella is um, Bella happens to be um, Pratik's wife. Um, just for those of you who don't know. Okay, so we have some good amount of people in the chat already. Tell us where you're from first. The last time we had oh. such an international crowd, it was like all over the world. Wait, my fringe is driving me nuts. It's just going in my eyes. I'm sorry. Okay, so as you guys, um, from those of you, for those of you who don't know, Pratik is an amazing retoucher. He also does photography. He is. Are you are you a Phase One ambassador? Because I saw it when I was googling you. I so I am a Capture One ambassador, and then Bella okay. is a Phase One ambassador. So we both ah. just have the full spectrum of the Phase and Capture. Nice. <laughs> You're just like you have it. You have it in all possible. Um, yeah, areas covered basically. That's great. Um, okay, so we are going to start. I have some questions for Pratik here, and then you guys can ask in the comments below as well. Um, and yeah, we'll just see. Oh, we have Estonia, we have Chile, uh, Peterburg, Peterborough, uh, UK, Dublin. Oh, hello from Dublin. Oh yeah. There we go. Close. And I, and I representing. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Close to home. Okay. So first, I'm going to start with asking you because I know um, when you started, you started as a photographer, right? As I feel like a lot of retouchers do. Um, yeah. So what made you change? How long did it take you to realize that you prefer retouching over photography? And how long did it take you to make the transition to do uh, retouching full time? I had a really interesting career in terms of where I got started. I know a lot of retouchers today haven't even shot before. Like I talked to a lot of mm -hmm. retouchers who I hire and, and outsource to and and sometimes they haven't even picked up a camera, but they love the the creative aspect of photography. So for them it was such an easy way to get in the field. But for me, mm -hmm. I actually started with learning Photoshop first in high school. And then after that, when I picked up my camera in college, um, I hand in hand loved retouching simultaneously as I developed my passion mm -hmm. for photography. So it was one of those things where I felt that, you know, to have a good understanding of photography really helped my retouching. But yeah. the reason why I love retouching so much is, and I'll be honest, I still don't know to this day specifically why. Like I get zoned, I zone out while I'm retouching and it's something that I find really appealing mentally it feels like yoga as i'm doing it to be honest mm -hmm. with you so for me it was an innate reason i just felt gravitated towards it and it was like safe space it felt really really nice to be in a zone where i could work and be creative and not really have to think too much and just go with the flow and you know mm -hmm. I, I learned recently it's called being in flow state and which is mm -hmm. a state where your mind is the most optical uh, optimal in terms of you know operating so that was I think the moment I realized retouching for me became the most important thing for the creative process, at least in my world. That's very interesting what you're saying, because I find I'm the same when it comes to shooting. When yeah. I start shooting, it doesn't matter, you know, what kind of energy I had before the shoot. If I'm if I was sad, upset, tired, it just completely switches off and I just go into this creative zone and yeah. 
I don't think about any of my problems or anything that's happening in the outside world. I do kind of zone out. Um, funny enough, we had this conversation, it was a week, two weeks ago on, on our live. Yeah. And since then I have received my tablet. I finally have received my tablet and I used it for the yes. first time. <laughs> I'm excited Yay! for this. <laughs> I know. I, I did like my first retouching. I had my self portrait that I was doing for my friend's channel. And um, I was like retouching my, my forehead for a while. I was just like sitting there just doing. And you know what? Like I, I, well, I had to start somewhere. Okay. I was like, okay, I'll just do my forehead because a bit, a bit easier, a bit less like spots and like yeah. stuff. So I was just like sitting there and coloring. And I'm like, okay, I can see the appeal of, of it using the tablet. It's a bit better because it is kind of like drawing in a way. Yeah. Because when I was using, you know, I, I, as, as a lot of you know, I've been using a trackpad for a very long time, which is quite embarrassing to admit. Um, but it is kind of like a, a bit of a different experience because you just go like this with your finger and it's just <laughs> not very exciting. But with the, with the tablet, I can see, I can see how it will be way more like therapeutic and so on. But yeah. also I feel like, I feel like I was on my forehead for like 50 minutes. I was just like going at it and I was like, oh my God. It's like if I actually I, had to go for the entire face, I would never finish. I would be, I, I, I want to see this forehead now. It's probably the most perfect forehead anyone's ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, but thank you. Um, so yeah. Oh, we have some, we have some, there's so many, so many people, Poland, Singapore, Brazil, San Francisco, ah, so UK. Um, i you're all here. Are, yeah. Uh, are you originally from Texas? Yeah, so I actually live in um, Houston, Texas, and but mm -hmm. at the moment I'm here in the UK because my wife and I have a traveling relationship. She lives here in Oxford, England, and I'm in Houston, Texas, and we've been traveling constantly, even from the beginning of our relationship. So mm -hmm. we've been going back and forth, and it just so happened that because of the you know the lockdown, I've just extended my trip a little bit longer here in the UK <laughs> because I never know when I'm going to get to come back again. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's true. Yeah, it's, it's the same for you, right? Because you have um, you living in Ireland at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I I left I left Bali, so I thought that I was actually here for five weeks now, but it turns out I've I've, I've been here for six already. Um, yes. And yeah, I don't know when am I going to be able to leave. I mean, they might be able to open um, Bali maybe like next month or something, but I still I still don't know because it's just. Um, yeah, you just you just never know, um, and it's kind of like I can I, I can probably come back maybe next month, but I just don't know if I want to because I don't know if it's mm. going to be safe, and I don't yeah. want to be stuck in a situation again where there's going to be second wave and I'll be there by yeah. myself, yeah. without my family and without my you know close friends and so on. So it's kind of like a very tricky situation, but I don't want to be here either. So it's kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're in the same boat. Yeah, I feel yeah. Um, how do you how do you find it, if you don't mind me asking? How do you find it? Is it very challenging for you to? you know, for, for you guys to obviously be away from each other because um, when you're traveling so much and when you don't you see her, because I remember, I actually remember seeing Bella posting something about how she hasn't seen you for like a few months because it was like January or something and she was saying that she's only going to see you in March. Yeah. Um, how do you guys, like, how do you guys handle it? If you don't mind me asking, if you of do, just, course. just tell I, me to. I love talking about it because I think this relationship has inspired so many creatives to think mm -hmm. outside the box and think that they don't have to be in the same location anymore and they can mm -hmm. find someone that's maybe not close to them and pursue that opportunity and the reality yeah. is you can but there's a few things you have to remember it's that communication is the most important thing in any relationship but specifically long distance relationships you have to be <laughs> yeah. communicating and willing to know that you know you might not be the best at communicating and you have to be open with each other about your feelings and if you know you if you're not and she's not we can you can both talk about it and figure out what it is specifically that you need to work on. And we had a growing pains as well when we first began. But I think now we've come into this rhythm where we realize um, what it feels like to be away for a while and together for a while. So it's mm -hmm. we got accustomed to it and you can get used to it. Um, but in the beginning, it's really tough. But you just yeah. have to give yourself permission to learn what it feels like. And then it becomes a lot easier to um, make yeah. it happen. Yeah, I feel like that's the thing because I've I've spoken to a lot of my friends who are creatives or are not even creatives, but they're kind of stuck in the same situation where let's say they are separated from their loved ones, and they don't know when are they going to see them again, and it's this kind of un like uncertainty of not knowing and just yeah, it's just it's just difficult. But it's kind of interesting to see it from a perspective of someone who's been kind of doing this kind of like lockdown relationship for like a while now because that's basically what it is and it's yeah. definitely it's definitely a bit different um but yeah okay let's get let's get back into retouching um okay so 
what I wanted to ask is, um, I know that a lot of people are probably wondering that, how does one build a good, strong portfolio of retouching if you don't, as you said, shoot any yeah. good images? Do you like approach people for images? Do you just like find them online somehow, somewhere? How, how does it usually work? When I first actually started looking for images to begin with, I started back in the day when Model Mayhem was, was you know, a big platform. Back then, mm -hmm. it was maybe 12 years ago or 13 mm -hmm. years ago now. And not to date myself, but back then, I used to be really involved in the forums. And mm -hmm. um, what I started to realize was there was actually some good talent there. You know, obviously, not everybody's, everybody mm -hmm. there is great. But yeah. there was still some people that had really good eye. And maybe they were hobbyists and starting out. Some were some professionals as well. And what I began to do was I actually started getting involved in the community and talking and engaging with photographers and showing them that I kind of, you know, really understood and was passionate about this field. It wasn't just something I did for money. And mm -hmm. because of that, you know, I could then develop a relationship with them, being able to talk to them on a regular basis. And then it became easy to ask them, hey, mm -hmm. can I use some of your images for retouching? I'll do it yeah. for free. And for if you don't like it for whatever reason, it's fine. Um, but if you do like it, I would like to use it for my portfolio. And that honesty, I think, was really important for me to actually mm -hmm. get images in my book and get images that other people didn't have. There were forums um, within Model Mayhem that actually had people posting um, raw files for free to you. Mm -hmm. But I never read a ton of those because I wanted images that no one else had, which was mm -hmm. a luxury, of course, and I understand. But that gave me the chance to stand apart from everyone if I did something completely different and got images that no one else had either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's the thing because I I know myself. I I get um, requests often from people being like, "Hey, can you just give me an image or, or two? And a lot of the time, a lot of people won't mind because it doesn't really matter, you know. Especially if you're, as yeah. you said, I think it's good if you approach them and be like, "Oh, you know, um, I can use your photos. Like, you can let me know if you if you like them and you're okay with me posting them." Because I feel like I guess a lot of the time there is this worry within photographer community where if you start giving like you know your photos to everyone somebody can really butcher them and then your name is still on it because they will credit you as the photographer and they will be like oh my god you must be it's a horrible a, photographer because that looks really bad so there's definitely yeah. this worry but um but yeah i i definitely like agree just reaching out to people and looking for photos is definitely a, a good way to go especially because if you don't if you, if you don't shoot your own stuff it's it's kind of challenging you know right and, and, you know, you have to think about it from a photographer's standpoint. Imagine you're getting a message from somebody you've never spoken to, to be able to be like, hey, give me your work. It's something that most people are going to say no to, especially if they don't know you. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to talk and, and build a reputation, you know, or part, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, build a connection first mm -hmm. before you start asking for those things. And also um, tell them that it's okay if to say no. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Make it personable because you get so many just copy paste messages that are, don't feel authentic. And you really mm -hmm. want that touch when you're, you're, you're talking to somebody that you've never spoken to. That's the thing. Um, you know, that, that's one of the things that I wanted to ask you about because the other day you posted this TikTok that I, that I uh, messaged you about. It was uh, what was the TikTok exactly? I can't remember. It was it was uh, the difference between being being um, was it what was it? It was being professional versus being approachable. Was that was that yes. what, what it was? It was about um, the the ability to be tr trustworthy doesn't necessarily come from what you say, but often it's how you say it and how mm -hmm. warm you come across. And if you come across warm and understanding to the person that you're speaking with, there's a higher chance that for you, for example, will respond more positively to me on mm -hmm. whatever I say. And that just builds a lot of trust without, you know, uh, questioning. So I think if, P if you come across and present your ideas, no matter what it is, in a really spiteful and harmful way, in a really aggressive way, you're not really going to convince people that don't already believe you. So you're yeah. just doing a disservice to yourself and your ideas by mm -hmm. not coming across warm and approachable. Yeah, I think that's the thing. It's just like you have that that um, difference between, you know, being like ego driven. And yeah. you can see that when people are like when you present your ideas and you're like all about me, it's like me, 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 me. <laughs> Versus when you're when you're, you know, as you said, if you're a nice person to work with in general and it comes to everybody, it comes to photographers, models. You know, I've heard of so many, especially photographers, I feel like because with photographers you know there's obviously there is obviously ego involved because like when we come into the set we are kind of like the main person on set but at yeah. the same time 
you know, if 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 a person comes into the set and they just like start, you know, just bossing people around, then <laughs> nobody will want to work with you. Like even if your work is great, it, yeah, people don't want you to be an asshole. Nobody wants to be, you know, treated badly. But if you come to set and you're so helpful, you're so friendly, and even if your images might not be that great, people will remember you because you made them feel good about themselves. That's true. And you didn't make them, you know, go home and cry. And and I think that's the difference. <laughs> You and know, you're it, a very it good example. You're a good example of this because you come of across making people cry. No, no, no. <laughs> you come across very confident, but also you come across approachable. So it shows that you don't have to be an asshole just to get ahead. You can be good at what you do, but still be nice and confident in, in what your skills are and know and acknowledge yeah. that. So it's a good balance to have. I feel like that's the thing. It's just like I feel like you know, if you if you know that you're good at something, you don't have to have that ego to to kind of have to i feel like you almost try and overcompensate for whatever right. you're lacking with the ego mm -hmm. and you're like oh my god like if i if i present myself you, you know kind of like the fake it till you make it mentality yeah and it's good up to a certain point but then eventually there comes a time where you're like i just i'm just i just don't think i'm a nice person anymore <laughs> 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 and i think that's the problem and it's you know it's it's a hard balance because sometimes i'm sure you've experienced it as well there's probably the clients and people that will take advantage of you being nice and they will try and walk over you and then yeah. how do you kind of push mm -hmm. pull that back and be like no no okay i'm nice but yes. i can still stand my ground so it's kind yes. of like a very delicate balance of yeah. of um kind of dealing with that um let's see hello alex um nice to see you as well um so someone asked any tips to grow your photography or touching business and that's one one of the things that i wanted to ask um just before we we got on here i was just saying that you know i feel like you're an amazing retoucher but i also think you're very good at marketing yourself and selling yourself in the right way and yep. you know even uh, your retouching series that you have on um it's it's sue bryce's platform right you said it is. It's um at Portrait Master, so it's her problem. Yes, I will. I'll I'll show it to you now, um, everyone. So they're touching series. There we go. Um, so this is the this is you sitting in front of uh, frames. I love this photo <laughs> so much. Me. So <laughs> that's me just sitting in front. Of, it, it's such a good photo. It's great. Um, yeah. So we have. So you have your course here, and this is all the all the courses that you do, right? Within the course, mm -hmm. um, all the classes, and then um. Is it, is it, I can't remember if it's, if it's like that or not. Um, you had the course for a certain amount of money and then you add extra content over time. Is that what it is? So you pay once, but you receive new content. Well, what happened was in the beginning, that's what it was, but we ended up filling out the content of the whole course already. So I don't know what the mm -hmm. future is specifically for this platform, but it's very um, encompassing yeah. of everything that I want to talk about, especially from the researching standpoint, if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. learn about not only the basics, not only the advanced material, but the combination of everything and also things that people less talk about, you know, things that mm -hmm. aren't really out there anywhere else as well. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, okay, so going back to, um, sorry, I just need to find this. Okay, we're here. I'll just remove this and I'll be back here. Um, so just going back to the question, um, how do you establish yourself as a retoucher? How do you find your ground how do you find your niche how do you find your clients um how do you make people come back to you how do you just grow i, I know it's a, such a broad question but do you have any tips that you could share with people no tips <laughs> just tell us everything <laughs> <laughs> nothing i'm going home I'm bye kidding. no it's like i'm done <laughs> um yeah it's a great question and i think this is something that's less spoken about so i really love mm -hmm. talking about things like this and mm -hmm. i can only reference this from a personal standpoint because if you think about even photography and you talk to photographers and you listen to their interviews and you figure out, you know, what ways have they actually established their careers, you'll find so many different answers, whether it be yeah. a connection that they found and somebody was like, hey, you should be a photographer. And suddenly they have all these connections from in front of them. Mm -hmm. Some people had no connections and they caught a lucky break. Maybe they got interviewed somewhere and suddenly some ad, di ad art director contacted them, you know. So here's one thing I took away from everything. There was a, an article that Creative Live did maybe like four years ago where they asked me, they asked like really top creatives where how did they get started? Where do most of their business come from in, in their respective field? And it turned out a lot of it was word of mouth. And that actually surprised me because is it the same for you, Anita? Do you find word of mouth is um, really big? 
Yeah, it depends. It, it depends on a few things because, um, you know, when I was in Ireland, then yes, definitely. That was definitely it because I would work with the designer and then the designer would see my work. Nowadays, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a very weird person to ask that question because I do YouTube. So it's like, I don't really work with clients as much per se, um, you know, yeah. and I'm mostly because I think because I travel so much and because I'm never in one location for an extended period of time, it's kind of hard to get a hold of me. I find like a lot of the time I go to a location, I do shoots and then for months afterwards, people are like requesting me, but I'm not there anymore. Yeah. So it's kind of, so I feel like for me, it's actually mostly Instagram and YouTube. Um, yeah. But as I said, I am kind of like a digital child. Like I'm online, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm an online photographer. So it's a bit different for me, um, but for sure. I mean, it is kind of like a digital word of mouth, you know, in terms of yes. um, Instagram or YouTube because they see me working with a brand and then they know the brand and then they want to be like the brand or, you yes. know, they're friends with the brand and they're like, hey, you know, I want to share with you too. And so definitely yes. I agree. And that absolutely counts in the word of mouth scheme because right now, even back then, it was the same for me. My word of mouth was very different where, as I mentioned, Model Mayhem before, I mm -hmm. actually had my first platform there. And because of the fact that I kept engaging the community, many people then started coming to me directly. I never really had to go out and say, hey, can I work with you? And the biggest difference, and we you know, cycle this again, is talking about the warm approach you have to people. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a warm approach and you're just there to show your work, say nothing about it, and give nothing to anyone, no one's going to come to you. So mm -hmm. you really have to think, what do I have to give to people aside from just showing my work? You know, is mm -hmm. there some sort of personality that I'm showing with my work? Am I engaging with the community? The same thing happens for me for Instagram, because if I am not engaged with the people that follow my work and the ones that like my work regularly, obviously not everyone, but a few people that, that I can manage, yes. you know, it shows the community really does matter these days. And the Absolutely. more you grow the community, the more attention you start getting from places that are not even in your control. Yeah. And, and that's what Absolutely. happens. Absolutely. Do you know what? I agree with that because that's what happened to me with YouTube. You know, it's like, as you said, um, if you are just a photographer and you just post your work at the end of the day, nobody cares about you because you're just another person sharing their work. And unless yeah. you share something valuable in return, that's where my YouTube comes in because, you know, OK, I show my, share my work, but I also share exactly how I shoot it, exactly how I edit everything. Um, you know, so I provide values to, to people and, and in exchange, they provide me with their support of my work. Yes. So it's kind of like, a, it's always like an exchange. It's never just going to be, oh, I'm just going to take nice photos and people are going to love it. Like at the end of the day, there's thousands of people that take nice photos. So yeah. unless you provide them with some sort of a value, as you said, you're either like a nice person, you're somebody that, you know, some of my best friends, uh, you know, that are photographers, I'm friends with them because they were so nice and so approachable. And, you know, they would say, you know, they come in ni nice things in my work. Obviously, that's not the reason why I'm friends with them, but I'm just saying, you know, I'm like, okay, unless you comment three times a week that my work is gorgeous, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to schedule. be friends with you. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean? They, they, they just genuinely engage in your work without you like having to, like, obviously, I would never ask anybody to be like, hey, look at my photo, you know? <laughs> um, but, you know, some of, some of my friends are just like genuinely like nice people and they don't mind, you know? I, I feel like, especially within the creative community, there's such a big stigma of like people showing support to each other just in case like, oh my God, like, yeah. you know, I'm going to lose work if, I, if I'm if right. i friends with this photographer. And like, at the end of the day, it's not true. It's like mm -hmm. you, people would choose you for you and for your work, you know? And it's like, if you happen to be a friend with another photographer, like you're not going to lose any clients. And yeah. even if you do, I mean, it, it happens, you know? If yes. somebody's better than you, I mean, you know, cry yeah. me river, it's fine. Yes. It's just... Yeah, it's, don't it's, expect it's, the loyalty. It, it it might come, it might go, you know, but just be prepared to continue. But, being but also, you know, but regardless, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's not even down to your photographer friends. Sometimes, you know, a client might just reach out to you directly. And are you supposed to say no just because your friend is working with them? You know, it's kind of like, yeah, I don't I don't think it's I look at it from a perspective of like, even in terms of YouTube, I feel like there's enough space for everyone. And exactly. everybody can everyone can get work. It's just I feel a lot of the time, maybe if you're not getting work is because you, A, either maybe don't have work that's strong enough mm -hmm. or B, you just don't know how to market yourself. And and I think that's one of the big things that I find in general in terms of photography and retouching and, and everything else in general, that people just don't really know how to market themselves. Yeah. They put a lot of time and effort into their, their craft, 
but then they don't spend any time yes. learning how to market, how to, as you said, especially network. I think networking is crucial. So massive. Um, and even as a retoucher, you have to keep in mind that there are so many photographers out there in the world, as you mentioned, that do great work. And mm -hmm. a lot of them are looking for retouchers because the, the ratio of retouchers to photographers is it's like one to I don't even know. You know, it's insane. Yeah. So there's no it's almost impossible to, you know, fail at it, I should say, because once you have a good book done. And if you're there constantly showing your work and talking to people, engaging, networking, and going out there for meetups and whatever it is that you can do physically, even if you don't live in a location that you can meet with photographers, do so online. You know, set up initiatives. And like you said, YouTube now is there. Instagram is now there. Like so many platforms exist for you to actually do this. And then once you get those first few clients, you'll be surprised how much they recommend you as a retoucher because they like working with you and they yeah. want their friends to also find someone. And, you know, people keep asking, do you know a good retoucher? It happens so regularly. I of get course, it every yeah. day. Absolutely. You know? And I'm the same. It's like whenever, whenever I start working with a new retoucher, I like sometimes uh, I like working with people who have a very small portfolio, but I just see their potential as good yeah. because usually a lot of those people are very receptive to, if you have any changes or if you need anything fixed because they're not, you know, they're not set in stone in their ways, which I, I find sometimes it's good. Yes. Um, but so many times I see, you know, those kind of people will be starting out and then like literally three months later, they're just swamped with work and, and I message them and they're like, sorry, my waiting time is four months. I'm like, God damn it. Why did I tag you in that photo? I should have just tagged you. I should have just hit you. Just hit you disclosure away. Agreement. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that's the thing. It's just like, you know, um, of course there's, you know, there, there's loads of like retouchers, but like, look how many photographers they are. And, and even in terms of, um, you know social media like when you look at all the influencers working and taking the jobs technically away from photographers because a lot of them have like boyfriends or even they shoot them themselves mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. instagram husbands you know mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. that's me <laughs> <laughs> you're like hey bella let me take a photo of you but at least you're a prof you're, you you can you can be like you're like a like a professional instagram husband because you're actually like you actually yeah. know what you're doing so it's great <laughs> um Okay, um, so let's see. Rahul asked, any advice about approaching the uncertain future in terms of retouching? Mm, that's a good one. I actually deal with that too because right now I don't really know what the future is going to be. But what I do know is I can count on myself and my skills and my personality and the knowledge and history that I've had as a retoucher to know that I can acclimatize and really you know, ch change with the times because it's going to change, obviously. We don't know you know, how many jobs are going to be coming through to people and how many photo shoots might still happen for, you know, commerce. But there's one thing to keep in mind. People are still buying out there right now. People are buying goods and services and people are mm -hmm. buying games and, you know, we're watching movies and all these things have a photography component to it, whether it's mm -hmm. clothing, you know, people are online shopping. So it's never going to go away. It's just going to change the form that it comes in, it might not be a specific form of fashion photography anymore. It might be e-com, you know, it could be so, mm -hmm. so many different facets. And I think that is exciting because it gives opportunity to see what changes are going to come in the market and pay attention to what people are buying these days. Cause that also dictates what people are going to shoot more often. And mm -hmm. maybe even use this time to take your retouching skills in your eye and apply to other fields like now i'm looking into things like 3d design and development because i can take my realistic eye see what's right or wrong and apply it in the 3d world so that people can have better products like that so i think nowadays you know you can take just what you are good at in the retouching side and expand that to other aspects for video editing and photography and lighting yeah. and art directing and all kinds of stuff. Absolutely, I agree. And I think from my perspective as well, because I've been sp speaking to a lot of my friends who maybe are still in lockdown or you know, some of them are able to work uh, to some extent because maybe they're able to get like their model friends and shoot with them. Mm -hmm. They are swamped with work. Yeah. It's not like the work goes away. There is going yeah. to be such a massive influx of work as soon as this is over because mm -hmm. brands are desperate to shoot i've been getting so many requests as well people because people st still think that i'm in bali <laughs> and they're like hey like you know i actually had this rant the other day because i had a bunch of uh people message me like a bunch of brands message me in 
uh, you know, and just be like, hey, you know, when are you planning to be back in Bali? <laughs> like, when am I planning? <laughs> like, what am I planning right now? My only plan right now is to work out at 3 p.m. and have a live at 7. <laughs> That's the only plans that I'm making right now. And it's just like, I get why they're asking that. But at the same time, it just kind of like really rubs me the wrong way because it's just yeah. like, hurt. like, it hurts. It's just like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, it shoots straight in the heart. I'm like, I am not yeah. planning anything. So, but you know, but, but I know brands are very eager to get back to it. And I feel like as soon as they will be able to get back to it, they will. So I wouldn't yeah. necessarily worry about like the future of retouching yeah. or even photography. I, I feel like maybe if you're a wedding photographer, you're going to have a bit more of a hard time because obviously there might be a way more restrictions and there's so many weddings canceled, but Absolutely. brands still need to shoot their content regardless. And I feel like the sometimes it's going to be better for retouchers because I feel like, if sometimes they have to cut corners and maybe shoot it like, you know, with maybe not necessarily like a super professional team and stuff, they will need their retoucher to fix yes. it for them afterwards. So, <laughs> oh yeah, totally. Not ideal, but, um, but yeah, I, <laughs> so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too concerned right now. Like it's still pretty fresh. I know a lot of places are opening right now. So, so just, you know, oh, yeah. hold tight, play it's with coming. your retouching skills, just, you know, <laughs> like, and, and you'll be fine. Yeah. Now is the time to learn more than ever. Uh, absolutely. So we have another question. Hi, Pratik. Uh, what is the difference between Adobe RGB and P3? Which one do you oh, prefer? That's a very good question. I have question. no idea what that means. Oh, well, we're going to learn something today. Yeah. <laughs> Exciting. So, I'll be honest. I, I, I know what it is to a certain point. And after that, I haven't really looked into it too much. I know Adobe RGB is specifically more towards photographers. And Adobe RGB, to, to really talk about it, is a color space that we use mm -hmm. um, as a container for our colors. It tells us, and it tells the computer, and it tells everything, especially what we're looking at on the screen, um, what range of colors we're going to see and what we're not going to see. And Adobe mm -hmm. RGB is pretty industry standard. Most people who work on photos use Adobe RGB if they're using TIFFs or PSD files. and. Um, and on the web, they use sRGB. Adobe RGB has a lot more colors than sRGB in terms of the color space. So it contains a lot more possible colors. However, um, P3 is another color space. It's also very large and it contains a lot of colors as well. It's mostly used in like the film world, I believe, especially if you're doing video. Um, but I guess the, the, the number of colors was relatively similar, except the colors that it does display is a little different. So it's kind of like the cousin to Adobe RGB, if you want to give a really good analogy to it. Um, I don't think we really have to be too concerned about it as photographers right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I just say stick to Adobe RGB. And if you want to look up the difference between P3 and Adobe RGB, there's a lot of good articles and videos out there showing you a visual diagram of where the P3 colors lie where the Adobe RGB colors lie. And um, they're very similar. Um, some might show more saturation in the red tones, and some might show more saturation you know, closer to another spectrum. So that's the best way I can really keep it simple and summarize it. That's good. That's you, you kept it simple enough for me to understand, which is a big yeah, one. Yeah. Because <laughs> usually when there's like loads of terms thrown at me, I'm just like, yeah, la, la, la. My, brain, my brain just goes like little fishies like swimming around and that's it that's me that's me done <laughs> i was a really horrible like student back then like trying to learn these terms i just couldn't do it so i understand i'm the same and it's just i always feel bad because i i mean the way i learned photography was basically just you know just feeling and touching and making mistakes. That's basically yeah. how I learned. I've yeah. never learned like the proper technical terms. And especially because when I when I, when I I first came to Ireland, I was 14, I came from Poland. So my English was not that great at, 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 like back then. So even terms like aperture and, you know, shutter speed and all this stuff, it kind of, it all blended together. I didn't really uh. understand the difference. So <laughs> yeah. it's definitely been a, a good learning curve from there. <laughs> Now at least I know, and then but sometimes I still get like messages from people being like, "You said it wrong," and I'm like, oh. <laughs> "It's fine." I, I think people like us make good teachers because if we can under if we can learn a really hard concept from a point of being very mm. hard to learn something, we can talk about it better to the point where more people can. That's understand. that's what I find. A lot of people always say that the way I explain things is pretty simple, and I think I do it because. I learned it in a simple, like a simple way. I didn't learn it in a technical term. So I don't throw technical terms at people. I throw yeah. it at them in a way that I understand myself, which is usually very simple. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. I love your work. Keep up the good job. Thank you very much. Um, so 
so yeah also why why most of the famous photographers not mention retoucher's name in their post probably what i just mentioned because the minute they do the retoucher gets swamped with work and they get stolen away from them so that's exactly why they don't do that and i understand that <laughs> um hello i'm a huge fan of you both congrats for the live okay so i have a question for people uh, and i have a question for you but um uh, while i before i ask you the question i want to ask people the question so they have a chance to comment while we discuss it so um if you guys are photographers or retouchers what is the most ridiculous request you've ever received about either i think mostly retouching so so let's just stick to retouching so what's the most crazy retouching requests you got like you know photoshopping a third arm in or you know or like a second head or <laughs> like surprise me just just comment comment and like let me know what you what, what was your craziest and then we can we can ask you now and you can yeah. tell us what was oh, your boy. craziest oh it's i i don't think i'll be honest i don't think i've ever um had anything that was insane like okay maybe there's been some times where people would say hey could you is it possible to turn the person's face a little bit you know like rotate a little bit more so you can see mm -hmm. like the other eye and stuff like that and that that used to come a lot more in the beginning when i obviously didn't have uh, mm -hmm. a high-end clientele and then didn't have experience and, and i think that was the funniest one for me like rotating people because it's like how mm -hmm. do you how do you see the other side of them if if you're just shooting their back Mm -hmm. <laughs> things like that yeah. are crazy or moving moving objects that have nothing behind them like hey could you just remove that thing in front of the wall when clearly there's not enough material to like copy and paste but they're just getting hopeful that anything's possible mm -hmm. so they're just asking for things to be removed that's not possible oh i love and, this one yeah. change curly hair to the straight one wow oh yeah <laughs> oh wow what was yours to remove an ex-boyfriend from a picture. Do you know what? That's a good one. That's why you, anytime you have family photos, you should always put your boyfriends and girlfriends like on the edge of the photo. So if it comes to like removing them, you just like, chop the photo off. And that's yes. It. That's my little. That's my little um, uh, tip. Please make me look thin. Yeah, I think that's like the, the thin thin stuff is usually pretty standard. I don't know. I'm trying to think if there was like an, ever anything super crazy. I mean. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I think I think maybe like back in the day, I think my craziest request would have been like back in the day when I was just starting photography and I was like shooting a bit of like boudoir and this kind of like, you know, just working with girls who aren't models and they would just like request some weird stuff like, oh, can you just like lift my boobs or <laughs> or I don't know, just like make my waist skinnier, make my, my, my bum bigger and you're like, okay. Yeah. Like, okay. Oh. I always get the ones that are like, can you open my eyes a little bit more? And it's like, it's impossible because the eye itself doesn't have enough <laughs> you just, you just open, you just did the liquefy and you just like, yeah. you do it like this and then like the model ends up like... Yeah, it's anime eyes. Oh my God. That's, yeah, that's that's a pretty intense. Um, so, okay. So, Paul is asking, Prat uh, Pratik, do you have photographer clients, sorry, do your photographer clients tend to do some basic retouching first or do they usually give you images straight out of the camera? That's a good one. That's a really good, one. good one. And here it's a good one because I know what he's also implying. Um, mm -hmm. The implication is that, is it possible for photographers to do a little bit of work or at least have some control of the image before giving it to a retoucher and working with them? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes, because I, as a retoucher, obviously can do everything, but I like it when the photographer is very specific about who, what he wants and what they don't want. So for instance, mm -hmm. some clients of mine will actually um, color grade images by themselves. You know, they'll do the color grading by themselves, yes. <laughs> and that's what I love because I don't have to. I don't have to read your mind. You can just do it. You send it to me. It's great. Yeah. Um, and some people prefer to process raw files by themselves and then do a little bit of work before sending it to me, or they might, you know, do a huge write up of what they're looking for. So there's many ways of working with retouchers, especially if you don't want to give up full control. You can do as mm -hmm. much as you want on your end and give us what you want us to specialize in. Yeah. Especially for me, I love working with skin a lot. Um, so for me, I prefer like working with Anita because if she does the color work, I do the skin, mm -hmm. you know, and spend 10 hours on a forehead. It's like my favorite thing. So <laughs> <laughs> it's just my forehead. It's just, this is, this is it. This is the That's area it. that we're yeah. concentrating on. Do nothing else. Um, <laughs> but you know, I agree. Like just adding to that, whenever I work with retouchers, I always do color grading myself because I feel like 
I I was when I started photography, I would be the kind of person who would never give up control over my photos. I'll be like, no, I need to do everything myself and all this kind of stuff. But I think later on I understood that really the main control that you have over the image is how the colors look. And I feel like if I was to give my raw image to a retoucher and be like color grade this for me, that would be yeah. wild. Maybe maybe I should actually do a video like that. Just um Yes. getting my re getting retouchers to color grade my photos actually oh, there we go you see yes. life ideas there we there we go <laughs> see you next week um but that's the thing so i feel like if i gave if i gave different retouchers the same photo and i just like got them to color grade it the, you know their way everybody would do it differently because everybody has a different style but i find like for me personally as a photographer the colors that i apply on my skin and on my backgrounds is like the most specific thing to my work it's, it's what yeah. people know me for like yeah. you know especially like my skin tones and stuff so i feel like if i gave that away i would pretty much give my whole art away yeah. so for me for me i will always color grade my own photos and then i will just um make sure to like you know if i send it to you and you work in the skin that's amazing because i feel like skin is just something that is like quite challenging for me and it takes so much time and i just don't really enjoy doing it so i would way rather get somebody like you who's way better at it than me you're way more efficient as well. <laughs> and, you know, in this way, I get what I want because I get my colors, but I also get, you know, what I want from you because I mm. get the skin. And as yeah. you said, I feel like communicating is so important mm. with the retoucher because a lot of the time, if if you give it to somebody and you're like, just just edit it, they'll be like, yeah, but like, what do you, like, that was me <laughs> at the beginning. I was like, just can you just it. retouch it, please? And he's yeah. like, in what, in what way? Like, what do you want from me? <laughs> <laughs> what's happening <laughs> I'm, like, I'm just like just retouch i don't know just just do your thing just like press the magic buttons i have no idea but now you know it's just whenever i actually ask someone i mean i usually work with the same people over and over anyway so they know me and they know if i want something you know i, I find usually when you start working with a new retoucher if there's like ever any changes like people learn quite fast what you like and what you don't like yeah. so it is great to work with like the same team of people yes. um and then you just kind of know automatically when they send you photos, you don't have to be like very specific about like, oh, change this, change that, change, you know, you just exactly. know that they like certain things. So it's definitely easier. Yeah. And also oh. when you have experienced retouchers, you also have the ability to work with them and they will know what to ask you if you've never worked with a retoucher before. So that Absolutely. always makes a big difference. So sorry, uh, uh, Jacko said, that's for the rid ridiculous requests. I know my baby is brown, but can you make him look whiter? <laughs> oh my God. Who does that? That's just that's just brutal. Oh my god! It's Michael Jackson um, movie. <laughs> wow. Uh, which is better, a TIFF image or a PSD file for retouching? Um, I'm gonna say TIFF because if you're just talking about PSD versus TIFF files, um, PSDs uh, have a two gigabyte limit in terms of layers, and the TIFF files have four gigabytes. And TIFF files are more readily readable by other programs too, so mm. they both do the exact same thing. Otherwise. Yeah, I always find whenever a retoucher sends me a PSD, it's always a nightmare because it always, for some reason, takes way longer to open as well. And it's just it usually just like crashes yeah. my computer, which is not ideal. Um, do you send photos with watermarks for customers to choose? I don't know who the who the question is for. Is it for me or for you? Um, I guess. I guess for me personally, if I um, if I do like a if I do a client shoot and I send them a contact sheet. I usually send them a contact sheet of nine, nine images where I do put a watermark on my photos. I've learned the hard way. Some like usually depends who is it for. Mm -hmm. Like if I send it to a model and I know the model, then I'll just send it to her without it. If I send it to any kind of client that I don't trust because I know they will take a screenshot of it and mm -hmm. put it on their Instagram, then I will put a huge juicy watermark mark right in the middle of the face. <laughs> just so they can't use it and I they need, can't photoshop I need one of those it. tutorials <laughs> oh my god that's great and and actually i actually also say at the bottom of the page um there's like a disclaimer that they are not allowed to use it for like pre-retouching you know they're not to allowed to use the raw photos for any purposes other than selecting mm. just in case because sometimes you really have to spell it out to people because they don't know um but yeah, how, how about you? I mean, you probably, uh, I presume whenever you work with photographers, you work out some sort of way of payment where you probably don't have to watermark, right? Or Yeah, um, in the beginning, what I tend to do is if I have a new new client, I'll get the payment ahead of time and then mm -hmm. end up sending the files because obviously based on my are going to be getting the files um, back to them once just, it's done. Just a, just However, a good little ransom. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> and then after that, with, when I work with them for a while, I just send them, you know, the files first and then they pay me. With commercial work, it's really tough because the commercial work, they sometimes pay, you know, 60 days out and 30 days out, whatever. So I don't really have a choice. It's not like I can say, I'm going to wait and hold on to these files till you pay me because I, yeah. I have a choice. <laughs> that's what I find. That's what I find very frustrating when I work because I, I find especially in Bali where the market is there, but it's not very professional. Like it's run by a lot of people who don't really know what they're doing, if, if I'm allowed to say that. Yeah. Um, because, you know, sometimes, you know, when you work in, in bigger industries, especially as you said, um, in this kind of sense, a lot of the time, if I if I do a job, I I send a, an invoice and then, you know, I have to wait 30, 40, 50 days, depends. I had magazines pay me after a year, which is ridiculous. But it's usually, you know, it kind of depends on your industry. It's like if that's the industry standard, you can't really request money in advance if that's not what happens. You know, right. if, if the whole country runs on 30 day invoice, then you go on 30 day invoice. Yeah. And I remember I had a situation before where the the model agency was messaging the designer and they didn't reply and the model agency absolutely lost it on me because I was like organizing the booking and they were like, she's not replying. It's been two weeks and blah. I'm like, it's 30 days. She has 30 yeah. days to get back to you. And even after that, it's just like, it was such a such a stressful situation for me because I wow. I had no control over it. I wasn't paying the invoice, the client was. But they were going after me and they were literally ripping my head off. They were like, is she your friend? And I'm like, no, I'm like, this is just not how it works. And I was trying to explain to them. I'm like, listen, it's a 30 day invoice. It's blah, blah, blah. And they're like, it never works like that. It's always cash like the horror. I'm like, oh, oh Lord, wow. <sighs> it was fun. It was fun. It was, um, it was during the pandemic as well. So I was like, I was like sitting at home crying every day about my life. And then like, they were like hounding me and I'm like, I can't do this. I can't <laughs> deal with it. But anyway, yeah. it's all sorted that's now. Some, so. That's some real talk about what to expect from the industry sometimes. Like, you just have to be prepared for it. That's the thing. And it's just, you know, there's different levels of, of people knowing what's happening and how to run the industry because certain people just have a certain idea of, like, what it's supposed to be like. But it's yeah. not necessarily quite the standard, you know? And it's just, mm -hmm. like, unfortunately, a lot of clients will take their sweet time to to pay you. And sometimes you have to hound them for invoices. And oh, yeah. it's it's oh, it's oh just it's just the joy. But I feel, have you noticed that usually... So usually I find personally, the smaller the brand I work with, so if I, or not even the brand, if I work with a person directly, right? Like a, like a designer or someone where they don't have other people standing in front of them, the payment is always faster than yes. working with like the bigger the corporation, the bigger the brand, the longer the payment takes. Absolutely. Yes, for sure. And, I've, and I, I see it for myself. Like whenever I do something, if I do like paid retouching or anything, like if anybody like asks me, sometimes I, f I forget I'm, I'm bad because sometimes I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. And then like three weeks later, I'm like, shit. Uh, but other <laughs> than that, like if somebody sends me an invoice, I just pay it straight away because I just yeah. want it like out of my hair. And, and yeah. I find when you have like big brands, they have to go through like the first accountant, the second accountant, yes. the mother of the accountant, the, the brother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> like you know how you have to ask the three dogs for permission and then like you finally get the payment so it's yeah. just oh, um yeah. um okay so rahul is asking for color grading uh color teams what are the sources color scheme designer and adobe color what is the difference i have no mm -hmm. idea what any of those mean so <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is very specific questions team. Um, you know what, to be honest with you, so basically, he's, I think he's asking for um, obtaining color themes specifically, and like, how do you get swatches from, say, an image, like a reference point. And okay. in in Photoshop itself, I don't think it's called cooler anymore. But if you go to extensions, like Photoshop extensions, there's, I forgot what it's called. It's like either Adobe Color or something else. Or if it's not there, just type in Adobe Color, and then you'll find you know, ways to actually get swatches in order for you to use as a reference point if you if you want to. And I have no idea what color scheme man designer is actually. So I don't really go by swatches so much. Like I don't really look at a reference and, and plot those points down. I kind of just go by eye and what I'm looking for. So while we're talking about color as well, mm -hmm. um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Prat uh, Pratik here is an owner of um, the infinite color panels, which oh, I'll share yes. now. There we go. Um, I did a video about them, it was two weeks ago around then, yeah. um, just kind of showing. So it's basically a, a plugin software that you use for 
um, for Photoshop to color grade mm -hmm. images. And it's very really cool. I got to play around with it and it was great. Um, so how did you how did you come about with the idea of internet color panels? You know, when I was um, doing a lot of color grading for my clients, I had a really difficult time figuring out the color palettes to use and the type of color grading that, you know, I should be using. Just like we talked about before about approaching retouchers and saying, hey, you know, editing my work, it's really difficult to figure out what you like exactly. So I wanted mm -hmm. to find a way to actually develop and, and give people multiple color grades um, to, for, for them to choose from. And so I was like, what could I do? And the infinite color panel itself is a panel that generates basically an unlimited number of color grades for every single image. And the way it works is that it, it puts five different adjustment layers on top of your image. And it for every adjustment layer, it adds a different setting every single time that you hit create or randomize. And what that does is that the way they interact with each other um, comes up with a specific color grade. And that's how color grading is done. And I actually based that off of my own PSDs and I looked at them and said, what is each adjustment layer doing? And what are the parameters of each of those adjustment layers? And I said, let me just put that into a randomizer and see if it actually works. And it did. Like they were based on those parameters, um, it actually produced really striking results. And then I was like, let me just make it through a little panel. And then we can have a, a tool that everyone could use. And it's like color shopping. If you don't even know what color grade you want for your image, you just hit create, and then suddenly you get some options for you to to play with and tweak until you're happy. So it's it's really it's really handy for me to use. And other that's people that's well. the thing I find like it's very handy for being able, especially if you don't really know what kind of colors you like and so on, because it gives you the kind of random co combinations that you can just go and like, oh, I like this, I like that, and yeah. pull certain elements and change them around. It's definitely a, a great little software. Um, and I, I also, um, if you guys want to try it out, I have a, I have a discount or link yes. in the description below, so you can just click on that, and it's, it's in the description. Okay, so um, uh, Fredricia asked, "I'm bad at retouching. Can you please give me some tips?" I think if you want some tips, I think you should um, check out uh, Pratik's uh, retouching, um, yeah, retouching series because I, it's so, it's so comprehensive and so big, and there's so many information. Yeah. and it has a lot of stuff for people who are just starting out too. So there's like a fundamental section for people to learn a little bit more about things like curves and what is masking and all that stuff before they mm -hmm. jump into some advanced techniques too. Yes. So Melvin Jackson is asking, is there a way to save your TIFF files uh, if they exceed the four gigabyte limit without having to flatten your layers? Yes. So you have to end up using um, the format called PSB. B, it used to stand for Photoshop Big, but it's actually large. The, the, the format name is when you're saving the document, Instead of saying TIFF or JPEG or PSD, you'll see one that says large document format, uh, PSB. And you want to save that. And that'll give you the ability to save larger than 4 gigabytes. The only downside is it actually makes it a little bit, um, it takes a little bit longer to save the file because it actually compresses that file as well. And if you don't want to compress the file, but you want a large file size, you can go into your settings under Photoshop, uh, Preferences, and I forgot the exact menu, but you can disable compression for PSB. And that's exactly what it'll say. It'll say disable compression for PSB files or large document files. Um, but be warned, it will make your files really large, but it'll save a lot faster too. OK, interesting. That's good to know. Oh, yeah, so we have. Um here uh yes so true Fed federal government as big as it gets <laughs> takes months and months to pay while small firms parent pay me in weeks it's always the way seriously like the smaller the company the more um you know um family like like the smaller the family is and the or like you know in terms of the company that the faster they usually pay it's it's seriously almost always the way um and then he said, dude, I had no idea that was you. I own <laughs> Infinite Color Panel and also uh, BW. Thank you. Saving up for texture products now. <laughs> awesome. Yay. 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 Uh, OK, another question. Whose color grade is more beautiful? <laughs> oh. 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 Do you want, I have a funny story about this. So um, Bella has. Uh, her own like color grading stuff and her platforms like the color lab and so she has really intricate color grades like she'll have uh, like 20 different adjustment layers for a layer stack so she's and she's very nuanced with every one of them to get to where she's looking for but sometimes at the end of her color grading work she'll ask me she's like hey what do you think about this there's something you need tweaking i was like hey you know what there's a there's a 
app called Infinite Color Panel. You should use it and then see if there's anything else that you would like. And then she gets so angry because I end up using it sometimes on their pictures just to like give examples. She's like, wait a minute, I kind of like that. So I, I think... <laughs> I think she's Burn. she's very good naturally. Like she knows exactly what she wants and how to get there. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of like, let me just throw a thousand color grades and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know, both techniques are pretty good. I find sometimes <laughs> you do have a certain idea of what you want in your head, but then sometimes if you just like twist it up a tiny bit, mix it up, make it a bit fancy, yeah. it does it was does work quite well if you just like take a chance and just do it. Um, I have another question for you. So, uh, you know, how how long ago was it that you first went on um, Creative Live? Oh, uh, I think seven, eight years ago. Was that like your first big event like this, or? Yeah. It was, and uh, how it was... did it? So, like, how did it affect? Because I remember, I think that's when I found out about you first. Um, mm-hmm. As I mentioned, I kind of I, I followed Lara Jade for years, and then I kind of got to know you and Fe- uh, Felix because he was her assistant at the time, right? yes mm-hmm. for a while and then um so yeah so how did it affect you how did it being on on creative live on a huge platform like that that had so much reach especially back in the day i feel like you know seven eight years ago you were yeah. one of the first platforms like this to do stuff like that how yeah. did it affect you and your business like did it, you know did you get really busy all of a sudden like how how was it well the experience itself was very interesting because when they called me to do it, I had already done some teaching before. I, I've been doing one-on-ones mm-hmm. a lot. I did presentations for ASMP, which is a big group in the United States for Photographers Association. Mm-hmm. And um, so I had that experience going for me. And again, because I kept talking about it and saying, look, I'm doing this thing, they finally you know, started paying attention and they were like, hey, this guy's doing retouching training. We should call him, which is why I keep telling people, Talk about what you're doing and talk about the good things that are going on in your life. It's okay. Don't feel embarrassed about it. You know, that's how they're mm-hmm. going to know. Um, so anyways, they contacted me. I went, on the sh- I went on the show and it was such an interesting environment because everything had to be done by 15 or 15 or 30 minute increments where if you didn't meet the mark, you know, it's, it's very risky because it's live and you have to make sure you're mm-hmm. on schedule. So the course happened. You know, I, I met a lot of people there. Um, the response was very good. And you don't know what your response is as you're doing the show. You don't, you only figure out later what people are saying and what they're talking about. And Mm -hmm. um, once the show was done, I realized that people actually liked it. They learned a lot. And of course, like anything else, people are going to say bad things too. And it's just part of the, it's just part of the way things are, but you take Mm -hmm. what it is. And it made me really busy after the show was done. Like I started getting a lot of inquiries. I started getting a lot of requests for more classes and more youtube mm-hmm. and, and things like that so i had to think about what it is that i wanted to do because naturally in this world we have so many different options of things that we can do i could have done a lot more youtube i could have done a lot more you know one-on-one training but i decided to actually build my business and continue working as a retoucher and i started expanding i grew an agency i had like six or seven retouchers working for me i managed them for a while um, and so then, you know, people started asking me to teach in different places, different conferences. I've now traveled to pretty much every continent aside from Antarctica for retouching. So it's taken me all over the world. It's let, let, me, let me meet so many people all over the world mm-hmm. um, and give other people jobs. It, it made me give the ability to teach other people so that they could take their careers and build careers off of it as retouchers and photographers. It's It's been wild. It's been really crazy. Yeah. That's the thing. I feel like also a lot of the time in situations like this it's kind of like a snowball effect you know i feel like that the hardest thing is to start out but once you get going it kind of slowly starts getting taking speed and then obviously something like that happens like um you know creative life it gives you so much more exposure and it is down to exposure a lot of the time um you know because you do need that exposure for people to know about you. You know, you could be the yeah. best photographer or retoucher in the world, but if people don't know that you exist, then <laughs> unfortunately, you know, Your you're not going to gonna know you exist. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's for sure. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I agree with that. Um, on that note also, how do you do you ever, you know, obviously if you have time, oh sorry, I'm moving my desk. Um depending on on how busy you are because obviously i can imagine you are quite busy how important would you say testing is because i know you know i speak to uh, to, to photographers about it and i think yeah. we are kind of you know u- unanimously agreeing that it is very important but how about from a retoucher's perspective 
Uh, it's massive. Like even now, I still test with photographers. Um, because mm -hmm. if I, for example, haven't done beauty in a while, or if I haven't done fashion in a while, or something, I mm -hmm. actually reach out to people and say, "Hey, can I retouch some of your images?" And the reason mm -hmm. for that is because I always want to stay at sharp. I always want to stay at the top of my game, even if I'm not getting paid to do something. And obviously, it's a di I'm at a different point now where I'm balancing retouching with product development with education. So I have more time to do retouching if i so choose to before mm -hmm. it wasn't the case i was working full time but testing and experimenting with things that i normally wouldn't do gives me the opportunity to figure out different skill sets that i might have or different clients that i could approach because it expanded my portfolio and as a photographer as you know like testing is your genetic code it really shows you what you know you are good at it shows your clients mm -hmm. what you're good at it feeds content it gives you ideas and like you said it's just a form of just losing yourself sometimes you know and having that's, fun. that's the thing and i feel like there's a few elements to it i think it's important in terms of obviously keeping as you said keep your work fresh because a lot of the time when you work professionally you don't get to work on that many like fun projects it's mostly just stuff that you get paid for yeah. so you don't really necessarily have like a super creative portfolio but then when you can pick and choose what you want and be like okay this is the images that i want that mm -hmm. gives your portfolio so much like it, it makes it look so much better yeah. um but also you know just for your i think for your just like mental health and just for you know just like just just loving what you do i feel like you have to be able to test and you have to be able to do things um, that mm -hmm. you love otherwise i find whenever i was in periods where i would just just work on on projects that I was paid for, I would become so miserable because I started the, like almost disassociating from my work because it was just the same boring stuff that I kept mm -hmm. doing over and over, and I was mm -hmm. just getting no enjoyment from it. It just became it just became a job. That's what it was yeah. basically. It was just me you, sitting, you know. Yeah. Yeah. How do you balance that? Like, have you ever gone to a point of burnout where you're testing too much or you're you're you know um, way too much? Yeah, for sure. I mean, absolutely. It's like you know, as I said again, for now my situation is a bit different because because of my YouTube channel because that's mainly what I do right now. I pretty much test all the time and then I just turn it into YouTube content. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I do. I did say that before. I never do a shoot if I can't do a YouTube video for it because, yeah. um, you know, for me, the only way to make it worth my while if I'm not getting paid for it from a model or from a client is to have the content for YouTube so I don't have to spend any more time planning extra content for my channel because mm -hmm. it just becomes kind of tiring and I just don't have enough time to do all of it. But I've definitely been in, in situations before where I've shot too much or maybe I was on a on like a in like on like a timeline where i wasn't that excited to shoot in the first place and then i would yeah. do too much and i wasn't really excited about the photos and then i would like hate everything and i'll hate my life and i would just it just it just goes but i think the longest i've been away from photography was like almost a year when i was in college because i hated college so much and it just made yeah. me hate photography as well and yeah. i just didn't want to pick up my camera at all so um that was like the longest and then eventually you just like but that's as you said it's because i had college work because i was working as a photographer but I wasn't really enjoying it. You know, I was getting just really bad work for like really bad money. Um, yeah. I was stressed in my daily life and it's just all together came up, came together and I was just like, no, I don't want to do it anymore. So that's a good thing though, because it shows you that you can take a break for a while if you need to. Absolutely. Oh, a hundred percent. Even, even now, I mean, I haven't like in the last six weeks, I've shot two FaceTime photo shoots. One of them is going to be up this week, actually, and a nice. self-portrait. And that's literally all I've shot. And, and there's mm -hmm. nothing. But I still have so much. I still have so much work that I haven't gotten to. <laughs> it's just like I just feel like that's it so doesn't matter. You could, you could you could lock me in a, in a room for like a year and I would still not get it done. So <laughs> oops. Um, OK, so how do you how do you get consistent color across a, a couple of images using Internet Color Panel? Oh, good question. Um, on the site itself, there's an education tab. Um, so if you click on the link in the description and then go to the education tab, you'll see um, there's a video about applying the series of colors or a uh, color grid that you found to a series of images because there's multiple ways of actually copying and pasting it, but there's a free script that allows you to automatically like take the layers from one file and then copy it immediately across every single image that's open in Photoshop. Oh, that's great. That's good yeah. to know because I, I know people were asking about it and, and I wasn't sure, but that's 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 good. 
Great tip from the owner, from the owner himself. <laughs> uh, okay, Tiago is asking, um, how long have I been a photographer and Pratik, how long have you been a professional retoucher? I started photography when I was 16, give or take. Um, it wasn't really like professional in any shape or form. I just that you picked up my camera. Uh, yeah. Professionally, I think I've been kind of on it since like 2012. So mm. eight years. Nice. Give okay. or take. That's, yeah. not, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, I started to take my first job back in 2008 or 2009. Um, okay. And that was when I was still working as an, with another job and doing it part time. Mm -hmm. So then full time, yeah. it's been eight years. Oh, yeah. So pretty much the same. That's yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. I just remember like the first year I started doing photography, like professionally, if I, when I was like paying bills with it, like it was so challenging because I was living in Dublin and Dublin is so expensive in terms oh, of like yeah. accommodation and food. And it's just like, I remember like my first, my first taxable like income was something like 12,000 in a year, which yeah. means I was making less than the cashier. And it was yeah. just, it was so challenging to just, um, to just like sustain myself and, and just like live off that money and pay rent. Cause my rent was basically more than like what I was yeah. making in a month. It was just, Oh so much. and i think that's that's one of those things also that adds to the pressure of you know obviously being a photographer or being a retoucher when you're so dependent on the money to survive and to pay bills mm -hmm. and it does make you way more i feel desperate to take money or you know jobs and you know get paid money that maybe you shouldn't be getting paid because it's too low yeah. but obviously when you're kind of desperate in, in, in this kind of situation you will take anything and that's one of the other things that is tricky yeah. and that can lead to a burnout because i think that's what led, led to my burnout because i was taking jobs that were like Two hundred dollars for a full day, and it's like, no, oh, it's so bad. Okay, uh, Tiago is also asking. Oh, sorry. Um, as soon as the pandemic is over, come to Brazil to have a uh, shoot Anita and then pretty uh, editors' images. Done. <laughs> Could do that. I'm I, I'm up for it. I'm all up for it. Yeah. Uh, how to be motivated? How to be motivated in this fast changing scene as a retoucher and fashion photographer? What do you guys do? Um. Hmm. Just do fun no, stuff. I feel like, I, I think for me, I just do fun things that I enjoy. And it's just, I feel like if you really do something that you love and you yeah. can really, like if you show it to people and you, if you really have genuine passion, yeah. then people will follow. Like I, I'm not, I'm not the fastest when it comes to like following trends or like changing. I'm, yeah. I'm this kind of person. There's something about it. I, I don't know what it is, but it's just, I'm very stubborn and whenever, you know, if there's like a video that go vi goes viral, right? I'll be the last person to see it. Cause I'm like, no, I don't want to see it. It's viral. I don't care. <laughs> I don't know what's with me. It's always like that. If there is a video or if there's like a new artist popping up or like new music, I'm like, no, I'm just not going to listen to it because it's mainstream. <laughs> I'm such a hipster. That's what it is. I think that's the problem. I'm just like, no, I'm too, I'm too cool for this. I don't want to see it. And then I'm like, God damn it. Why didn't I watch it four weeks ago? <laughs> <laughs> and then you securely watch it back and you're like, I like this. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. So I'm kind of like a slowpoke, slowpoke of, of photography. So it's just like I'm 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 very slow at my thing. But I just I just I feel like I just take my time. I do what mm. makes me happy. Yeah. And I just try and monetize with it like you know, with the ways I can. Like I, I feel like trying to monetize online is a great way and having a yeah. digital product. Yeah, because it makes your it. I, I feel like it makes you so much more secure financially, especially in those. Because you know, like right now, if I was doing photography and I was locked in, in here in Cork, where there's absolutely no jobs for me, I would be completely, completely, utterly screwed. That's but right. because I have my online product and because I have YouTube, it's a yeah. completely different story for me. So, yes. I'm sure That's you true. can relate to that as well. I mean, absolutely. you know, you're. You, in a way, at least, you, you know, you, you do your retouching digitally so you don't have to be in a certain place. But at the same time, if there's no photographer shooting, you yeah. still won't have the, the work. So, right. Yeah, it's a, it's really yeah, it's really good to know, because right now everyone should think about different ways they can, you know, um, be creative. Um, and especially if you have different things that inspire you, take a stab at it. You might fail. Like I feel I'll be honest, I feel like probably like nine different Photoshop related things before I got to retouch it. You know, I wanted to become graphic designer, digital painter, you know, sketch artist, a line artist, like all kinds of things related to art and Photoshop and photography mm -hmm. that I just failed at doing as a business. But then finally, retouching happened and suddenly that was the thing that people were excited about. It's like, great. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. And this was the same for me. Like I tried beauty, I tried fashion. And I did enjoy them. It was fine. But 
then I started doing swimwear and I was like, oh, that's what it is. This is this is where my heart is. I'm like shooting with half naked women at the beach. That's that's what I'm at. <laughs> okay, so Paul's asking, um, do you have a preference for the type of images you retouch? Beauty, fashion, product, etc. Well, Ooh. I love good skin work. Like if if it's just skin that I'm doing, I could do that like all day. You could lock me in a room for a year and next to Anita, I'll be like, yay, it's, let's work on skin. All day. I'll be <laughs> like, okay, you take all the skin and I'll just do other things that are, you know, yeah. that'd be great. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. I, I Yeah, I've never, like I personally never found like even like, product photography and, and all this kind of stuff that exciting. And I know some really beautiful product photography yeah. that I've seen and I'm always so inspired. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then I absolutely never do it because i'm not interested <laughs> <laughs> okay um so how about sharing your work as a retoucher if photographer doesn't want to be uh doesn't want to know that you do the edit for him how can you build your portfolio as a oh, so i guess what he's asking if if the the photographer doesn't want you to say Mm-hmm. that it's your um i feel like a lot of the time so from my perspective i feel like a lot of the time if you pay someone then you can pretty much request not to like for them not to use the work but yeah. i find if you don't pay them then you don't really have the power and you should never agree to retouch something for free and then not be able to use the images yeah you have to always get it cleared beforehand whether it is payment or non-payment you have to ask them specifically you know what is mm-hmm. the terms of usage can i show the before and after can i show the retouch file Uh, Mm -hmm. is if you're okay with it can I do it and these intentions really need to be stated because otherwise you get into a lot of trouble um, from both parties so I always part use that as a a thing I ask them beforehand um if I'm but that but that but that's what I'm saying like from my perspective if I'm if I'm paying someone like I I still I'm never I I never not tag people that I work with because I don't regardless if I'm paying them or not because I still think you know it's your work at the end of the day uh but I know certain photographers who would let's say as I said, if they pay someone, they won't credit them because they, yeah. they, you know, assume that credit is kind of like a form of payment. So if they pay them yeah. money, they won't credit them. Which, yeah. which to be honest, I don't Very necessarily strange. agree with. Yeah. I don't agree with it. It's still your work, and you're yeah. still the owner, and you still should be credited. But yeah. that's how it works, you know. And and but I yeah. guess as you said, like if you get it beforehand, if you agree on terms beforehand, yeah. then you'll be able to know it. But I, I would just work with people who you have clear understanding with, who agree for you to use the work, you know, um, afterwards and so on. Because if you're if you're putting your time in for free, make sure that you get something in return. Don't don't get don't let people screw you over. Especially <laughs> That's when you advice. look at like movies and you look at the title and credit scenes, there's a reason why every single person's credited. No matter how long it takes, they're credited, okay? So it's like That's it doesn't the matter thing. if they're paid or not. Like just just do it yeah i yeah i find it very peculiar and it's like especially for example like it happened to me many times where i would shoot for a designer and then their the images will be published in the magazine and i wouldn't get a credit it's just like nobody oh. no like nobody in the team would get a credit it's just the designer you know oh. so they would be like dress dress by blah blah yeah. blah and like nobody was credited and you're like <laughs> okay so the photos just took themselves basically yeah they did <laughs> oh so okay um how to keep growing as a creator. I'm a photographer and I don't think I am improving that much. How to grow and do better projects. Mm. Ooh, I feel like good. I feel like for me, it's just like trying projects that are a bit more, maybe like outside of your comfort zone, trying things that you're not necessarily very comfortable with. Because I find yeah. like anytime I push myself out of that comfort zone and I do something different, like try a different location or a different time of the day, Mm-hmm. it makes me it makes me know like find out more about myself and things that i like and don't like and even if the shoot is a complete failure because it happens you learn something from it and i think that's how you improve right like i remember think? the last time that i wanted to change my comfort zone um i started shooting flowers and it's something that you don't really think about because it's like oh mm-hmm. the animated objects and their product stuff whatever but you learn so much from the way you light flowers and the way you color grade them because you know the angles are similar to the human shape and based on the way the lights are you know mm-hmm. co- composing the image you get ideas that you normally wouldn't have just by shooting the same old thing and maybe even the same setup it might be just a matter of like placement of the lights so i always think change up what you're shooting push outside the comfort zone start 
putting in things that you normally wouldn't do. Maybe there's like mixed media that you want to try and add some line work to your work. Yeah. I don't know. All kinds of stuff you can do. Yeah. And also in terms of like getting inspired, just, you know, just look at Pinterest, look at photographers like oh, maybe on Instagram that you find inspiring and so on. Because I find a lot of the time, if I feel like I'm in a rut, I would like look at my friends, you know, portfolios or go on Pinterest. And if I have any specific idea in my head that I want to do, I would just type it in and see what's out there. And yeah. a lot of the time, the ideas are absolutely incredible and it just really opens your eyes and it just makes it so much more exciting as well. So um, by the way, guys, we're on like an hour and 15 minutes now. So we're going to wrap up in like five minutes. So you know, you can you can go on with your life. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll just take a few more questions and then we'll wrap it up. So, um, okay. So um, uh, Tiago is asking, uh, Anita, I know you use Lightroom and Pratik uh, uses Capture One. Uh, what are the goods and bads from each one? Have you have you ever used Lightroom much or not really? Yeah, I have to use Lightroom as well because sometimes clients, for example, when they send files over, they'll send the XMP file with it or they might send like a catalog or something. So I have to actually process through Lightroom as well um, in order for me to actually use their files. Okay, so I feel like you're, you're better maybe to answer the question. Like from my perspective, I love Lightroom for color grading and for... Um, just cataloging all my photos because I have like the clear catalogs and I have them and like, you know, I star them and, and I set them up in a way. So it's very clear and I can like reach the files very fast. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously for me, I just use Lightroom for color grading with my, with my presets. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just super quick and easy for me. I can apply it over like in multiple images and that's it. I can't really speak about Capture One because I haven't really, I've, I've used it once like three years ago. So I don't think I can, I, I have enough experience to, to talk. Yeah. So maybe what's what's your point of view on, on both? I think, um, you know, I want to just try and be as un, completely unbiased as possible. And it, it comes <laughs> down to, it comes down to <laughs> comfort level. Number one is mm -hmm. how comfortable are you with the tools and can it get the job done? That could, that's mm -hmm. the number one thing. Obviously when learning like a new tool, obviously you have to spend the time and it's a little bit uncomfortable, but now there's so many different resources. If you ever do want to learn capture one, for instance, um, the YouTube channel does have a really good free playlist of getting used to capture one. Also, they have a new feature where you could import your catalogs from Lightroom to Capture One. Um, okay. And there is Ooh. a specific workflow in Capture One where <laughs> if you go to, I think it's like workflow, and mm -hmm. there's different settings you can do. And one of them emulates Lightroom's layout. So if you want to get oh. used to, it's called integration. Yes, the workflow is called integration. And if you click on it, it arranges everything just like Lightroom, the little strip bar with the images going across um, where you'd find all your adjustments and stuff like that. So that's all there for you. So if you want to get used to it, it's it's perfect. Um, that's it very uses... smart of them. That's yeah. very sneaky smart. Oh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's cool. And then yeah, the other okay, difference yeah, um, oh, yeah. is going to be the color editing tool. So they have... Um, like color editors for skin tones. So if you're, mm -hmm. if you have like, you know, let's say across the skin tone range, you have reds, yellows, and all kinds of different saturation levels. You can select the skin tones and then unify them so that they're all, all similar. If you find that like your hands are too red or whatever, there's layers, there's mm -hmm. masking. Now you can edit with your healing brush, just like you did in Photoshop and Capture One, um, all kinds of so stuff. So it kind of feels like Capture One is almost like a blend of like Lightroom and Photoshop together. Yeah. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Okay. I actually downloaded Capture One for the first time and I want to play with it. It's just, again, there's so many things that I have to do beforehand. Yeah. It, I just feel like it's going to be a perfect distraction from doing the things that I'm actually <laughs> going to be doing. So maybe I'll be doing Capture One soon. Um, oh, I need to start at 16. So you only have five or so years experience. Thank you very much. That's very flattering. I'm not as young. Uh, I'm not a spring chicken. Well, I, I'm not as old either. I'm 28. It's not as bad. Uh, <laughs> I'm not there yet. I'm not a big thirty yet. So, uh, okay. So I've asked this question already. Um, give her touching tips on TikTok. I think you should do that. Oh, should yes, I've thought about that too. Actually, yeah, we should do it. I think do you, have TikTok I think you should. I've I've posted like two videos, but I'm I just feel like I'm too old. Like this is like one thing where I feel like I'm too old for this. I'm like I just up with the kids. I can't do like all the TikTok dances. Like my back will no. crash. Like, yeah. I just, I'm just, I just don't feel like I'm cool enough to pull it off. At this point. <laughs> My God, at the minute I said we're about to finish, like everybody just like flooded in with the questions. There's like <laughs> questions there. Um, 
Okay, um, let's see. Uh, what Anita should be, what should be the shoot idea uh, to make you want to collaborate for the shoot while you're in Ireland? I just like, at the moment we can't leave the house. So like I was actually just checking. So Ireland has a ban for leaving the house outside of like five kilometer zone for another two months. Two months, uh, with really? July? Two months, yeah. So 20th of July oh, uh, until I can, like, I can like leave and go to like somewhere else, um, which is, I'm I'm not even going to comment. I'm going to leave that. I'm hoping to be gone by then. <laughs> anyway, so maybe I'll I don't know. So yeah, so um, that, that I don't think there's going to be much happening in Ireland for me to be honest. Okay, um, how do you get models to shoot uh, without paying them but help each other for growth purposes? One thing I'll say, and this is something that's been discussed before, and but I think it's very important for people to understand: work with people that are similar level of portfolio as you are. Um, because otherwise you'll have to pay them. If, if, if a photographer is much better than, than you and your model, then the chances they're going to want to get paid. If a model is much better than the photographer, then she will want to get paid. And that's as simple as, as simple as, you get the point. Um, you have to work with people that are at a similar level in terms of your skills. And this way you can help each other grow and you will be able to start, you know, start starting at the bottom. Now we're here. That's literally what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to start with someone at the bottom and get there together. But it's it's going to be hard for you to find people that are like way better than you or like, you know, way more experienced and get them to work with you for free. That's yeah, my true. perspective at least. And it's the same with like retouchers and everything else. It's just like you have to you have to have something in common on that sense to, to kind of be able to. Um, mm -hmm to work together. Okay, um, being a retoucher, do you prefer a model with clear skin or uneven skin and uh, you make them perfect? I mean, you can, uh, you can, I mean, you can do, but do you prefer to uh, too much retouch? Do you prefer mm. good skin the way it is? Um, I would say even for me, although I enjoy good, I enjoy skin retouching and I, I, I love a good challenge and it makes me really excited to see the end result. It's so, it's so fascinating. Um, when it comes to the sake for the sake of getting a fantastic image, you always need a model with as good of a skin as possible and mm -hmm. good of lighting as possible because yeah. we're trying to get the most realistic results that look great and timeless. For that reason, you know, yeah. because I really want my models to look as great as possible. I feel like in general, the least retouch you have to do, the better it mm -hmm. is. And that's, um, I was actually ch chatting to, um, to Sarah on my previous life, if you guys want to check it out, yeah. it's, it's in my lives. We were actually just saying that, you know, when you first start photography, you depend much more heavily on Photoshop. And I find when I was starting, I would do so many hours with just, just fix it in Photoshop, but it's just like, some things you just can't fix in Photoshop. If, if the light is bad, if the model skin is bad and you don't have the necessary skills, it's going to be very hard for you to recover. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, the quality of the photos suffers. So I feel like now, the better I get at photography, the, the less I have to use Photoshop. Some some images, I don't even use Photoshop at all. Like I don't even send it to the retouchers because I'm like, it's fine. Yeah. The model has good skin, that's it. Yeah. Um, so I think I think it's the same. I, I'm, oh, what happened? Oh, you just disappeared. You just went black, just disappeared. Okay, we're back. Oops, um, that's okay. Um, I was like, where did he go? He was just, just like, bye. <laughs> And he's gone again. And you're back. Is Bella playing with the light switch? <laughs> no, you're fine. Can you hear us? I think we we lost we lost you. Hello. Yes. Oh no. I we lost, lost you. you. Oh, it's fine. Someone got lost. Um, I can't okay. hear you for your audio. Oh no. Can can people hear me? Let me um, exit and, and, and then come back real quick. Okay. Cool. We'll just uh, we'll just be here by by ourselves for a minute. Just just you and me. <laughs> Hope that's okay. Um, okay. So let's see if there's any questions to me in particular. Um, will my code work for Infinite Texture Panel Two? Uh, I'm not sure. I'll chat to Prat uh, Pratik. I'm sure we can work something out. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think it does at the moment, but we might be wrong. Oh, okay, there we go. 
Hello. Sorry about Yay, that. Hey. we're back. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's start with this question first. Uh, what do you do to clear skin without pimples and blemishes? Uh, just global dodge and burn? Uh, yes. If if I didn't have to do any like healing or cloning work, then I would just go straight to dodge and burn uh, in order to kind of even out skin tones and a little mm -hmm. bit of frequency separation too. So it depends on okay. both. And okay, then uh, what do you think about doing full general retouches in C1 uh, with the healing update that they previewed a few days ago? Um, I would say that I have had actually really good luck of healing with the healing brush in Capture One, and you, there's a blog post coming in on that soon. Um, and there's no reason why you couldn't do that. So if you get done with healing and that's all you really have to do, you could do everything else in Capture One. So you can do the um, dodge and burn with with your curves and, and layer masks in Capture One, so you don't have to actually go to Photoshop anymore. Um, and if that's all you really have to do, and then some color grading, then you can be pretty much done. But if you want that you know, familiarity, then you can also go to Photoshop if you then so choose to want to for anything else. And then another one, I switched in January from Lightroom to C1, and I love it since then. Not the catalog stuff, that is very bad. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, they also have sessions as well. So if you don't like using catalog, sessions are more akin to having um, a catalog per shoot as well. So that way, if okay. a catalog gets corrupted, then you don't have to worry about it because it's every shoot's independent from each other. Mm. OK. Do you recommend iPad Pro for retouching? Absolutely never. <laughs> Just kidding. No. <laughs> You're like, <And> the... <laughs> You're like, the no. Reason, yeah, no. The reason why right now specifically is because there's no curves in iPad for Photoshop. So mm. they have a lot of updating it's, to do before it's usable. It's so random. I, yeah, have you tried I, it? It's so weird. I no, I don't have I don't have the iPad. I just it's just like I have the watch and I have my phone and I have the computer and I have the AirPods and I'm like, I'm enough of a sucker already. I don't need to spend a grand on the tablet that I don't <laughs> So that's my that's my point of view on this. I spent enough money with them already. I'm done with them. <laughs> um no it's fine I, I do love them but yeah i just i just i just i can't justify spending a thousand thousand dollars on a on a screen because that's basically yeah. like i would use it to like watch well, watch movies most of the time so i just i can't justify it yeah yeah so um <laughs> i'm sorry oh my god i choked on my own um spit that's great um sorry uh jay Le leonard is asking will my will my code work for infinite texture panel too the Infinite Texture Pal is a completely different site. It's on infinite-tools.com, so no, it won't. Um, but there's still figuring that out for um, that site. But it's a different site altogether. OK, fair enough. Um, thank you from Mumbai and all the awesome answers and great conversation. You're welcome. OK, we're going to wrap up now. So this we'll just read the last two questions. How to work with hard light while retouching? I often find sparkly effect on skin tips please mm -hmm. this is very much why it's very important to learn good healing and cloning first and you'll find a lot of those examples on the series as well and honestly the re the reality is every blemish that you want to remove make sure that your healing brush has the right settings and that's going to be making sure that the size of the brush is about the same as what you're trying to remove because you're trying to remove as less texture as possible and you're trying not to do frequent separation to begin with because it can be very tricky if you're trying to balance, you know, the skin texture and the colors by doing two different steps. With the healing brush on a blank layer, you can easily just remove some of those blemishes and smaller ones by one stroke. So mm -hmm. again, make sure your healing brush has the correct size. And it's for me, I use a 0% hardness healing brush. And I feel like that just blends the textures a little bit better and is more um lenient when it comes to the results that we get um and then just practicing and learning when you need to use a clone brush when you use a healing brush for me the clone brush really does come into play when the he the healing brush doesn't work so a clone brush comes in when the healing brush is is over its head and then i dodge and burn after that if you guys need any of the links uh, that we're talking about, like the, the retouching series or the infinite color panels, it's going to be all in the description down below. It's there now. So just in case you want to check it out. Um, oh, how yeah. to, OK, one last question, and then we'll be done. How do you use uh, logic in retouching? Sometimes we tend to do a lot of uh, a lot and create aliens. How to apply <laughs> logic in various retouching and coloring processes to make natural looking images? This is why it's so critical to, I think, um, study photography because mm -hmm. when you understand what a human should look like you tend to make more logical decisions on what you remove and don't remove number two 
don't zoom in so much to an image that you forget what you should be removing and not removing you know um in photoshop if you go under i think it's like window view and new window for a specific document um, you're able to get a copy of the image that you're working on it's actually the same image but you can say zoomed in on one and zoomed out on another and that way you can maintain perspective when you're um, retouching one image uh, your image so you can stay zoomed in but on the on the view that's zoomed out you can see the perspective so again only remove what you think should be removed and don't start guessing what else you're supposed to be removing because the second you start guessing um should i remove this or not then it becomes uh, problematic and you run into issues like that yeah absolutely okay so final one here he also asked please guide us to where to find more videos to learn the proper way as i said um check out uh, pratik's um retouching series because it's really good it's very affordable and there's so many videos there and if you guys are on the budget you can always look into youtube there's so many you know free resources that are out there it's just you have to do a bit more digging um I do retouching videos, but like considering I'm sitting next to you right now, I will not recommend them because I don't want to be embarrassed. So um, no, you should I actually like actually <laughs> like the results that you get. So people should check them out. They're very there good. There you go. Check my channel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, oh, uh, I think this live could go for a couple of hours longer. <laughs> he will die. He'll be like, okay, I'm going home. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much guys we're going to wrap it up it's been an hour and 30 minutes so um i think this is awesome think, yeah it was great i loved it it was so much fun thank you for everyone that joined thank you for all the questions there's so many questions it was great yeah. thank you so much for uh for joining us and for doing this live with us and teaching us all those difficult things that i forgot already <laughs> i'll have to like look to this through this live three more times and yeah thank you everyone um Everyone enjoy your day, evening, wherever you are in the world. And I will see you guys on the next live very soon. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.